was before all this pandemic stuff in Australia. I did a uh, I did a documentary over there in Melbourne and Sydney on cryptocurrency back in the day. Nobody knew a thing uh, about politics in Australia. It wasn't on the forefront of their mind. They couldn't tell you who the premier, the prime minister was, you know, maybe the prime minister, but that's about it. Then they have a capital building, right? In Australia, they have the capital building and a capital called Canberra, which is so far in BFE, like nobody even goes there. And it's the most masonic, weirdest looking place, small. Nobody knows who anything is. Anybody can run uh, in a country of 24 million with the the most lucrative underground military bases in the world right there, closest to a place called Atlantis. Excuse me, Antarctica. Yeah, you want to know where Atlantis is? The, the, the missing continent that was right there between Japan, Indonesia, where all the plate tectonics are just rumbling. And there was a catastrophic an event that sunk that continent, broke it away, and went into the drift out of nowhere, went into Antarctica. Now, I've always kind of under, been under the impression places like Antarctica, or excuse me, Atlantis, this, the lost city of Atlantis, I always thought it was maybe by Brazil or de- then for a while, then Indonesia. Indonesia is a good place to start. And then it drifted into Antarctica. And that's where you have a breakaway, break off civilization that's down there. That's using the space weapons. We're not even privy of knowing. And I say space weapons just so you have the idea that is causing earthquakes in Turkey, that is causing the northern lights to give an earthquake to Iran, if you recall, back in 2009 and many other places around the globe. I will start uh, since we have to be brief. I have already given all pertinent information and supporting documentation to the Senate Intelligence Committee and Arrow. They informed me that all of my information will be recorded for public record and shared with Congress. It is that important. In 2010, I was selected to go down to the South Pole Station in Antarctica for an entire year by Raytheon Polar Services as an employee of a third-party contractor for the National Science Foundation. I function in a dual-role capacity as a tradesman and a firefighter. My responsibilities required me to be more informed than most of my crew and offered me complete access to the facilities. What I learned from this unique experience needs to be shared with the entire world. The technology at the South Pole Station certainly can do what it is presented as its primary purposes, and unfortunately, much more. The Ice Cube Neutrino Detector is presented as a passive listening device for the purposes of the science as presented. But I'm going to skip right through the chase, folks. Uh, I have provided documentation that proves that the 5,160, what they call DOMs, that are embedded in the ice can actually transmit at 2,047 volts each. That gives us a long list of things to consider. It is effectively a multifaceted directed energy weapons platform that I will uh, list rapidly a few things that it can do. Death Star. Vehicle detection. We're learning that these off-world craft, on-world craft, ours or other nations, are also emitting neutrinos. So this makes the South Pole Station effectively an air traffic control station for this new level of equipment that nobody's discussing. In addition to the ability to detect neutrinos and the exotic vehicles, I have provided documentation that shows that this is also a system for faster than light communications. In the past, Gary McKinnon has hacked NASA found the off-world fleet, the list of captains, and it's apparent that if we have faster-than-light vehicles moving throughout the system, we're going to need faster-than-light communications. This is that facility. Unfortunately, I have other bad news. The season that I was there, 2010 to 2011, we converted from uh, construction to operations and maintenance in both the elevated station and the detector array. Unfortunately, when they first fired it up, that was when we had the earthquakes in Christchurch, New Zealand. There was two incidental shots before they were able to target it correctly. This is an earthquake generating device as well. This is the weapons of war that we have to deal with now and what Raytheon's hiding. There's an ELF system at the South Pole Station that when I was arrived, I was told it was off, dismantled, and completely defunct. In my work, I will rapidly just tell you, I had to figure out the circuitry for certain other repairs, and I found that this system is, in fact, completely energized, up and running, and being utilized with the other systems for nefarious purposes as well the atmospheric research observatory is uh in what we call the clean air sector i witnessed myself a very powerful green laser shooting out of the top of this facility into the cosmos 
This, I believe, is a secondary form of long-range communications and or a defense system. I am not saying that we need to be scared of anything that's out there, but please understand the military industrial complex is happy to invest all of your money in alleviating their fears. <clears throat> a question of power comes into play for all of these facilities that are present. I assure you, I knew what was going on. I knew the load demands of the facility and all of these new items exceed the demand for the systems that I was presented. I am doing due diligence and research. I believe there is either a secondary power supply there that is either nuclear that uh, was there prior to the start of the Antarctic Treaty, which prohibits such things, and or that there is some sort of exotic uh, power supply system there that just is not in the verbiage of the treaty, so it negates the responsibility to the parties involved. In fact, if you study the Third Reich, they were talking about going off Earth or going off civilization to have their own HQs all over these weird different parts of the world that you just think is frozen tundra. We had the Third Reich down there in Antarctica doing God knows what back in the 30s and 40s with technology that is beyond the capability of our imagination. And that is a very, very fascinating subject. Very fascinating. Very fascinating is, I yeah, the Lost State of Atlantis. They're, they have something down there where all the elites are going. Um, you have, what's his name? John Kerry, who went down there with his little black eye. You have, uh, you know, this is why New Zealand, they want to eradicate the natives of New Zealand. You had all the Hollywood who's who elites start moving there about 15 years ago. You have James Cameron, who's there, who actually directed what? The Titanic, which is in the news tonight. We're going to get to that in one second. You had uh, Matt Lauer, formerly of the Today Show. So much so, all these elites started going there, just like they started going to Hawaii. And when the who's who of elites go to any country or any city that is a, a decadent area, a tourist area, one of the first things that has to go is the gun rights. So there's no pushback. But they were going to New Zealand so much that the government of New Zealand had to put a cap that said, you have to be like a natural born citizen here or something to that effect to purchase land, purchase land, land rights in a country that was roughly three million strong as of 2015, 16, right, right around that area. So now Antarctica, Australia, which are the closest land masses to Atlantis, to a Antarctica, they want to clear out and make those bases. That's why you had those fires all over Australia. What was that, four years ago? It was the most heartbreaking thing I've ever seen in my life. Like I've seen the BP oil spill. I've seen some some very hardcore things. I think we all have in, in, in the course of news and the history of it. But seeing Australia burn, especially you know in, in the eyes of Americans who love the wildlife of Australia, it was I, a lot of people cried. That gives us now to the Titanic. Uh, let's get into this now. I'm going to show you a piece here because um, we're actually about to embark on a uh, lounge episode about the Titanic very soon. But you had some very big players recently in the past 72 hours, I want to say, embark on going to the bottom of the ocean now to go look at the wreckage of the original Titanic. So I'm going to show you this piece. Pay attention to this, and then I'm going to tell you some things about this some anomalies and some very peculiar things of why this is uh, more than meets the eye and the cryptic clues it leaves behind. Check this out. Uh, we have some billionaires under the ocean uh, who are about 10, way, 10 hours away from dying right now if they don't get found. Check this out. The sub was exploring the wreckage of the Titanic. The sub went missing in the Atlantic Ocean near Canada. In a statement, OceanGate, the company responsible for the vessel and the expedition, says, quote, we are exploring and mobilizing all options to bring the crew back safely. Our entire focus is on the crew members in the submersible and their families. An experimental submersible vessel that has not been approved or certified by any regulatory body and could result in physical injury, disability, emotional trauma, or death. Where do I sign? Oh, -ho! take your shoes off. That's customary. OK. Wow. Inside. The sub has about as much room as a minivan. So this is not your grandfather's submersible. <laughs> we only have one button, that's it. It should be like an elevator. You know, it shouldn't take a lot of skill. The Titan is the only five-person sub in the world that can reach Titanic depths, 2.4 miles below the sea. It's also the only one with a toilet, sort of. And yet I couldn't help noticing how many pieces of this sub seemed improvised. 
we can use these off-the-shelf components. I got these from uh, Camper World. We run the whole thing with this game controller. Uh, it's about the size of a minivan. It houses five people. So on that sub at this moment are the pilot, a scientist, and three paying passengers who have paid a quarter of a million dollars each for the opportunity to get on that one-of-a-kind sub and go down two and a half miles to see the Titanic. So why isn't it at the surface? There, there is no radio and no GPS that <sighs> GPS that works underwater. So you really are on your own when you're in this thing. So why haven't they come to the surface? It, I mean, one possibility is they got snagged on something, um, and another possibility is that there was a leak, in which is very unlikely. But the the sub is said to have 96 hours of oxygen, and that takes three forms. There are sea carbon dioxide scrubbers, exactly the same thing you would have in a spacecraft. Then there are these emergency scrubbers. These they look like fly strips. They hang from the ceiling and convert CO2 to oxygen. And then if those get exhausted, there are actual scuba oxygen tanks under the floor panels that they can put on. So in all, that's that's 96 hours. There's a rudimentary toilet, which amounts to little more than a couple Ziploc bags. Um, and of course, they all brought snacks. So th there have been times, as you mentioned, last last year, uh, they got lost on the bottom for three hours during the expedition that I was I was on. Um, I guess what really worries me is we know that they sometimes lose contact with, they don't know where they are, but they wouldn't call for the Coast Guard unless that had been going on for some time. So my guess is that this is yesterday's expedition and they've now been lost for 24 hours. I, as a human, can't help but ask you what you're, how you're feeling looking back knowing you were on one of these and seeing what's happening now. I, I stayed up all night the night before my dive stress. I mean, I was, I've never done anything that could kill me before. And I was really, really scared. Then I had a conversation with Stockton Rush, the CEO. And he said, you're worried about the wrong things, like getting back to the surface, running out of air, those we got covered. Um, the things you should be worried about are these really rare things like getting snagged in one of those abandoned fishing nets that are miles long, um, seems really unlikely in the North Atlantic, or, you know, a leak, which is also really unlikely. So I, I, I don't know what to say. It sounds, it sounds bad. If all seven methods they have coming to the surface aren't working, then what's going on? Yeah, what's going on? Exactly. Exactly my words. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Well, what is going on? Well, let's uh, check this out here. Who's on that boat? Good question. Glad you asked. Look at this. Well, there are five passengers aboard the missing Titanic sub. Uh, number one is the Ocean Gate CEO, Stockton Rush. Number two, British businessman Hamash Harding. Number three, retired French Navy commander Paul Henry uh, Nar Nargalit. Number four, the Pakistani uh, businessman Shahazadana Dawood. And five, Shahazadana Dawood's teen son, Suleiman. Well, isn't that interesting? Now, here's another factoid that uh, you might have missed, too. The name of this submarine that's going under that it looked like a tin can, you know, swap meet Sally uh, put together thing here. I mean, how come these guys right here, how come these guys right here couldn't get in the fort a regular submarine is beyond me. I mean, even the yellow submarine at Disneyland would have been better than that just tin can junkyard, um, you know, contraption we saw there. But the name of it is called the Titan. Now, the Titan, which sounds like Titanic, is actually a novel from 1909 called the Titan. Would get this. Here's the premise of the book. Well, it's about a, a huge boat called the Titan, which happens to go into a majestic ocean with some very well-to-do elites, senators, and what have you, influencers back in the day, when all of a sudden, it crashed and killed everyone on board, including these influencers. Now, just fast forward three years, what happened in 1912? Well, just that. You had the Titanic that supposedly hit a, uh, a, a glacier, and it just supposedly and just happened to have senators that were going to be stopping a tragic, tragic bill signed by uh, the president, Hoover. Hoover, am I saying that right? Hubert, Hubert, yeah, 
called the 1913 Federal Reserve Act, which then gave us World War I, World War II, World War III, all the other conflicts, everything you can imagine. Just the print press started. They can accomplish everything they want, give us the Industrial Revolution, squash it, which is now we're in the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which has nothing to do with the humans. It's all about distincting, uh, extincting us, and which makes way for the AI. Excuse me, Woodrow Wilson. It just came back to me now. Woodrow Wilson, the president, one of the worst presidents of all time in the United States, Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow, who, who then, I guess on his deathbed, said the greatest mistake he ever made was signing the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. Gee, Woodrow, thank you. Where's your grave? Because there's something I want to do to it. Then point me where George Bush in his grave is with uh, John McCain, if you don't mind. Got a lot of graves. I got to water soon.